Welcome to today's webinar. We're just going to let everyone kind of join, give just a few seconds to let everyone get in, and then we will get started. Okay, it looks like we've got everyone joining us now. So we are just gonna go ahead and get started. Um, we'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. We're in webinar three of our seven days of webinars with our summer series with MFLA, the Mississippi Foreign Language Association. And this is a series about empowering with languages. So today, um, so I'm Dom Samples. I'm the Director for Professional Learning at More Learning at Avon Assessment. Um, More Learning stands for More Learning Opportunities Reaching Everyone. And today we are so excited to have with us Rebecca Aubrey, who is going to be talking with us about engaging and empowering our novice learners. So the title of today's webinar is Getting Them Talking, Engaging and Empowering Novice Learners. Just before we kick off everything with Rebecca, I just want to make sure that everyone here today does engage with us during the webinar. So make sure that you are introducing yourself in the chat. Make sure you're asking questions. We will have breaks where we can take questions and look at some of the conversation that you're having in the chat. And also want to just let you know that you will be receiving a link to a survey. And when you complete that survey, you'll get a certificate of attendance. Um, you can also follow along on Twitter using the hashtag empowering with languages. And so I can post the, um, how you can follow MFLA on their social media in the chat in just a minute. Um, you can also follow more learning. I'll post this in the chat as well. So make sure anything that you want to share with others that you put into that chat and as participants in the live webinar today, you'll get a PDF of the chat discussions so that you can go back and look at what was shared. Okay. So today our Twitter and chat moderators are once again Michael Raines, who is the Instructional Associate Professor of TESOL and IEP at the University of Mississippi. He's also the Vice President of Programs for MFLA and Edgar Serrano, who is our um, Executive Director for MFLA. He's a lecturer of Spanish at the University of Mississippi. So welcome Michael and Edgar. We're so glad to have you back with us again today. Hey, thank you very much and welcome everyone and we're glad that you're back again today. Welcome back and thank you Don and Avant for the, the partnership with MFLA and thank you Rebecca for sharing your expertise with us. We are looking forward to the presentation and please share with you with, with me your ideas and, uh, and on Twitter. Okay, I'll see you here in the back. Thank you both. So without further ado, I am going to turn things over to Rebecca. Rebecca needs no introduction. We all know her in our field for the expert that she is. She is our 2019 Actful Teacher of the Year. Um, and we've had the privilege of being able to work with her on some other projects. And I'm, I'm personally very happy to have you back um, with us again, Rebecca. So without further ado, I am going to turn things over to you and let you get started. Thank you so much, Dawn. Um, I am honored by the invitation to be here with all of you. Thank, or, thank you, Edgar and Michael, for your invitation. You know, Dawn, thank you for your introduction. It's so humbling to be introduced as an expert, and I never think of myself in that way. I think of myself as a learner and someone who's continually trying to reflect and learn. And I'm looking at, right now, we have 198 participants. I don't know about you in Mississippi, but uh, in Connecticut, we just ended classes last week and people are exhausted. And, and just even thinking about this right now, it raises the hair on my arms. I am so in awe of all 201 now of you who I'm guessing are on your summer vacation and you still want to continue to learn about how you can do a better job with your students. And so um, 
my, my greatest appreciation to each and every one of the 203 people now who have joined us. So I do, um, John mentioned Twitter. I would encourage you to follow me as well at Maestro Aubrey CT. And I also have my email posted there. I include those on every single one of my slides and I am more than happy anytime to respond to any questions that you have that come up as you're viewing the presentation or as you process it later. I love to share. So our objectives today are threefold. Edgar invited me to do this webinar um, several weeks ago, maybe even a month or two ago. And it was when we all had Corona distance learning fatigue. And I don't know if Edgar remembers this, but I said to him, I just don't wanna have to talk about distance learning anymore. I'm ready to go back to normal. Um, I think I'm kind of settling into the reality that it's going to be a while before we go back to normal, but I'm still very excited to talk with you today about classroom-based activities and strategies to use uh, to help get novice learners talking in the target language. So actual standards say that both the instructor and students should be using the target language 90% of the time. For novice learners, I think this is often very challenging because we often, they have a limited language to draw on. We want to get instructions and information out to them. It's so easy to slip back into English with them. So I really wanted to share with you some strategies that have worked well for me to get us sticking to the target language as educators, but also how we can start to empower students even right from the first day to begin to learn the use the target language. So the first part that I'm gonna be talking about before the break are kind of the, the backbones of it, how you set up the structure and the environment to promote target language use with novice learners. We'll then take a quick pause for the Twitter chat and comments, and then we'll move into a marathon run of a bunch of different activities that work well for me. I was just in a discussion yesterday where teachers were talking about how they love to hear about theories, they love to hear about philosophies, but they want something that they can take all of like, these bites out of and just like gobble it up and take it and bring it back to their classroom. And so that's my goal with the second half of what we talk about. So first I wanna talk about creating a safe environment. And for me, that begins with educating our students about what different proficiency levels mean and what we would expect their performance to look like at different proficiency levels. There are a number of different types of rubrics out there. I just put this example up here, but if you go to the Munzi Cuento's website, she has a variety of them. But I always, right after we kind of get going with the school year and establishing that rapport in the target language, we take a pause and we do go to English for a class or so, and we talk about proficiency levels and what it means. And for me, that is very important for laying the foundation for everything else that we do during the school year. And what I really emphasize with my students is that it's okay at the novice level for their language to be very limited. That's what we expect. It's also okay for them to make mistakes because that's what we expect. So once we have talked about what the proficiency levels mean, it's easier for them us to move forward, even if we constantly refer back to them. So that would kind of really be my first step. Once we've established that, it's very important to me to build community within the classroom. So drawing on these proficiency rubrics that we look at, we constantly talk about how each and every student in the room might be at different levels. Some students advance faster than others. We might have heritage learners. Some take just a little bit longer to learn things. And it's a constant discourse in my classroom that everybody's at a different level and that's okay. We also have a no laughing rule. Um, this means when somebody makes a mistake, it is not acceptable to laugh at them. And this is one of those moments where my students kind of started to mock me in September because I teach seventh grade, first year to Spanish. I would do this, sorry, we have to stop. I would break out of target language and we would address that community aspect that it is not okay to laugh at students who make a mistake. We're all at different proficiency levels and we need to embrace the fact that we are gonna make mistakes and it's okay. It's that we learn from those mistakes. And so instead, I encourage them to respectfully support each other. And so that means if a student might be struggling, other students can reach out to them and offer support or help. They are also taught how to respectfully correct each other, even if we aren't 
uh, fixated on perfection at the novice level, they are encouraged to respectfully correct each other. And so these are some of the strategies that we use, that I use to help build community in the classroom. And, and finally, um, we, we also do respect the right to pass. I don't like to force all students to participate in every, um, to speak out, I guess, in every activity. I do like to respect the right to, to pass and my students are encouraged to respect that right in others. As we move through the school year, I do usually try to provide scaffolding to get every student ultimately comfortable participating, but I don't like putting them on the spot. Another important piece of creating the classroom climate is to really be careful about choosing your battles. And so this means thinking really carefully about what your learning objectives are and what they are not. So first, are complete sentences really necessary? You know, when we ask some of those interpersonal, excuse me, in some of those interpersonal questions, I, when I learned a language, had it drilled into me that I needed to respond in a complete sentence. So a question like, what is your name? I had it drilled into me that I needed to answer, my name is Rebecca. When is your birthday? My birthday is February 11th. But if you think about our natural conversations in English, that isn't natural. If I ask Dawn when her birthday is, she's most likely to just tell me her birthday as opposed to answer in a complete sentence. So really think, are complete sentences necessary? If they're novice learners and don't quite have those full chunks yet, but they're responding in an appropriate way, to me, that is worth celebrating. Secondly, at the novice level, we are expecting them to only be understood by a very sympathetic listener. So if they're making errors in grammar or sentence structures, is it really preventing our understanding of what they're trying to say? So do we need to interrupt their flow and affect their mood and their feelings about themselves by stopping and correcting them on every point? Another area is with um, misspelled words. I was recently asked in a different webinar if I grade on spelling and I do not, as long as I can understand what the, the student is trying to say. This doesn't mean you don't necessarily go back and correct some of these errors, but I wouldn't do it on, the, on a specific case by case basis, I would do it bigger picture. I noticed some of you are doing this. This is a way that we can correct it. So really thinking about how you're choosing your battles and how you're responding to students and what you're asking of them. Next, provide effective feedback. And for me, first and foremost, this is always celebrating what kids are doing well. You know, when I started to teach, I taught in a very challenging district and a lot of behavior problems. And one of the things that my mentor said to me was find something to celebrate in them, even if it's to pay them a compliment on how nicely they're breathing. And I carry that over into language. If a student can only utter a word or maybe even respond with a gesture, they've showed me that they've understood and that's worth celebrating. We clearly have growth to make, but celebrate what they're able to do well. And again, going back to what I said in the previous slide, back off correcting every single error. It really isn't necessary at this level if it's not getting in the way of us being able to understand what they're trying to communicate. Because we want them to feel liberated in trying to express themselves, even if it's messy. And then I always give suggestions for proficiency growth. So if we go back and look at a proficiency rubric, I always then provide students with feedback that'll help them level up their proficiency. So for example, if they're using a lot of list of words, I might suggest to them, wow, that was an amazing list of words that you just came up with. I'm wondering if next time you might wanna try maybe pulling in a couple of short phrases or so. And so it's all based on the proficiency rubrics. Secondly, it's also important to provide an a foundation for success through a lot of structure and comprehensible input. So for me, it is always very important, both in terms of target language use, but also even just behavior, um, responding to students who might have um, um, learning disabilities or for a more trauma-informed classroom, it's really important that you have consistent routines. 
I've showed you here an example of a slide that is always up on the board every single day when my students come into the classroom. Yours might look incredibly different. People are doing these Bitmoji classrooms, which I unfortunately haven't had the time to do yet, but um, it's, it's always consistent. So whatever you do, it's always consistent, but it always includes what our learning objective is for the day, and we always talk about it. The objective is posted in Spanish. I've posted the objective in Spanish from day one of my classes, seventh graders who have never had Spanish before. We just walk through what it means. And by setting that learning objective, it kind of primes their brain to understand what we're going to be talking about in class today. And that's an important piece to being able to stick to the target language. I also like to give students a heads up to the plan that we might have for the day so that as we transition through different activities, they know where we're headed next and why. Um, and I like to be pretty predictable in terms of recycling a lot of the same activities, but I think it's also important so that none of us get bored to mix in little elements of surprise, but within the structure and the safety and the scaffolding of those consistent routines. Next, making your, comp your input comprehensible. So first and foremost, uh, make sure that you're, you're trying wherever you can to use cognates. You know, Spanish has great diversity in the language. We often have many conversations about um, the multiple ways we could say the same thing, depending on what country you're coming from. I don't necessarily think there's one right or wrong version, but if I'm introducing new language, I do try to find a balance with cognates with my students to use as many cognates as possible to make it more comprehensible. Secondly, make sure that you're providing a lot of imagery and signaling. Uh, we kind of do need to be actors and actresses. We need to be clowns. We need to, to be a little kooky and act things out so that we can really ensure that they're comprehending what we're saying in the target language as opposed to reverting back to English. I really believe that that struggle for them to try to understand what we're trying to say is such a productive struggle. We're firing such important neurons in their brain that aren't gonna be fired if we just revert back to English. Thirdly, stick to the Goldilocks zone. You know, Goldilocks had to choose the chair and there was one chair that was too big and there was one chair that was too small until she found the chair that was just right. Um, this refers to the student's zone of proximal development. So that area where we're giving them just enough challenge that there's a productive struggle with it, but it's not too hard for them and it's not too easy for them. So as you're thinking about what kind of input you're giving your student, make sure it's in that Goldilocks zone for that group of students. And um, then it's just so important to model, model, model. I like to do the I do, we do, you do model. So I will model something. I might then turn to a student who I know already has it. You know the one in your classroom. Model it with them. Model it with another student. Model it with another student. Before you know it, everybody in the classroom is able to do it. And you know, I was talking with a colleague recently about this, an amazing new teacher, second year teacher. Can't even really call it a second year because she had a baby last year and then we closed down for Corona. So she's really like a year teacher in two years. And she just said one day that it hit her to question whether if she couldn't say it to the students in the target language, was it really even worth saying? Like, can I find other ways to say something or am I asking them to do something that they're not ready for yet? And so I just encourage you to ask that question. I um, would be remiss if I didn't just mention Google Translate here. Um, and this is something I've been talking a lot about lately because a lot of people have been asking about it during distance learning, the fear that too many students are using Google Translate. And I think a response to that is embedded in a lot of the things I've already spoken about. So first, embrace a culture of risk taking. If your students have been trained to be worried about perfection and losing points for not being perfect, they're going to be afraid to take risks. So if you can create a culture of risk taking, they're less likely to turn to Google Translate. Secondly, stick to that Goldilocks zone. Don't ask them to do something they can't do yet. Thirdly, 
make sure you're modeling, modeling, modeling with comprehensible input. And finally, if you're going to use dictionaries, empower them to use them appropriately. I learned a great strategy from Rebecca Blowwolf, who is the 2020 Actful Teacher of the Year, who talked about how when she has students do different writing prompts, she tells them it's okay to look up a couple of words, but ask them to highlight it so that they can't take some responsibility, show some integrity for what they used. And then I always do like to respond with empathy by just instead of in a punitive way, just let them know, I noticed you're using some language structures that we haven't learned yet. It looks to me like you used Google Translate. Next time, let me know if you're struggling. I'm more than happy to help you. So I'll take a pause for some water and turn it over to Edgar. Okay, everybody. Uh, Rebecca, thank you for sharing um, all that information with us. I think many times students are afraid in the classroom to make mistakes because they believe that they have to be perfect in many ways. So some people here in Twitter are really um, sharing that it's important that really we recognize that errors have to happen because the main point is to just have a communication between two people. Um, some other people uh, use to create a env good environment in the classroom. They, they have a different surveys where they can ask questions to the students and uh, provide different resources for them to keep them engaged and to make them feel that they are part of their community. Michael, what are you hearing there on the chat room? Uh, there have been lots and lots of comments uh, regarding modeling uh, of the uh, information that's being presented. And also uh, some people were talking about uh, how often do they model versus uh, and also building trust within the classroom so that they'll be willing to take chances. And that's about it. Just lots of. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll respond because I think I have time to those um, two comments that you mentioned, Michael. The first is about um, modeling. Uh, for me, <laughs> and this might sound like an evasive answer, but I model it as many times as I need to. And so sometimes that means you start to model something and you think the kids have it and they're ready to go off and work a little more independently. And then as you're circulating the room, you notice, you know, I mean, Edgar works in the elementary school. What it would look like in the elementary school is that they're crawling under the table and they're hitting each other on the head with whatever, you know, resources they're supposed to be using. That to me in an elementary school is a signal that I've, I've stepped outside of their Goldilocks zone. I've either given them something that's too hard or too easy to do. And the same in the middle school, they'll start goofing off or, or doing something else. I'm imagining the same is true in the high school. So that means I need to back up, recollect the class again, and model again and walk through it again. For me also, sometimes it mean, means that I have to make tough decisions. That if I've modeled something several times, I've released them, we've come back together and I model again and they're still not getting it, to me, that doesn't mean I just need to explain it in English and tell them how to do it in English. It means what I'm asking them to do is too hard. And I need to change what I'm asking them to do as opposed to change the language that I'm using. Secondly, trust is very important to me in the classroom. It's an essential part of what we build at the beginning of the year. And I think a positive behavior uh, intervention system goes a very long way with that, ensuring that the positive comments that you're giving students far outweigh any sort of negative comments that you might be giving them. And that's both in terms of their work and in terms of any, you know, how they're behaving in the classroom. Because by showing them that you really care about them and you value them, it makes it so much easier to earn their trust. It's also really important to me that they know that I have their back. And so middle school students are really fearful of other kids making fun of them. And it's kind of, a natural go-to behavior of middle school students is to find a way to make fun of somebody else. And I make it really clear from the beginning that that's not okay in my classroom. And I want my students to know that I have their back, that they can trust that I am going to buffer for them from that. I'm not going to allow it to happen. All right. So I will move on to the fun, yummy, yummy part, the part that I hope that you'll take lots of big bites out of. Um, and this is learning activities. And so how can we develop 
learning activities that can be used in a novice level language classroom to get kids talking really from the beginning when they don't necessarily know a lot of language to work with. And um, some things that I think are important to cover are topics that I've already kind of touched on. First of all, I keep talking about this Goldilocks zone. Make sure whatever you're doing is within the Goldilocks zone for students. And sometimes that might mean you can take the same activity and provide differing levels of scaffolding as they learn more. And I'll, I'll talk about that as we go through some of the activities. I love information gap activities. Information gap activities are great for developing a motivation for why students might want to use the target language and do an activity. They're very challenging to do with novice learners. So an information gap activity would mean something like Edgar has information that I need in order to be able to com successfully complete my task, but I have to get it from him in the target language and vice versa. I have, I have information that Edgar needs. So I love to try to find information gap activities. Um, I like to look for activities that build language skills and not just vocabulary and language structures, but how can we build skills like circumlocution for when a student doesn't know another word, what else can they do to try to communicate? Um, I always like to make sure that I'm providing appropriate differentiation within the activity. And I already didn't mention scaffolding. How can we provide appropriate scaffolding? I have to give a little warning here, and that is that I have tried to give appropriate credit to where I got these activities from, but I'm pretty sure, um, you know, given my, my age and all that I juggle that I have probably gotten some of that information incorrect and I apologize profusely. Some of the activities I've kind of pulled together from different inspirations and I don't know who to attribute it to. So my apologies ahead of time if um, I've inappropriately appropriated an activity. I do not presume to say that any of these are mine. The activities I've learned about, modified, tweaked, or presented as is, and they worked really well for me. Um, my daughter saw me putting this bitmoji up and she asked me if I was trying to scare people. I'm not trying to scare people. I just wanted to make sure that I mentioned that these are not all my activities. I do not take authorship of these activities. First activity I wanted to talk about, I call pinguino or penguin. Um, this activity I learned from Barbara Horn, who is a first grade elementary teacher in my school. She's not a language teacher, but I pushed into her classroom for a year I did an activity with students where they each got matching vocabulary cards. So a word and an image. So it might be as simple as a picture of penguins and the word pinguino. Each student in the class gets one card randomly. It might be a picture card and it might be a word card. They get up and they move around and they shout out the word that they have holding it up. So if I have the picture of a penguin, I'm gonna walk around saying pinguino, pinguino, pinguino kid with the word is going to say pinguino, pinguino. And so you have this like funky chaotic environment where all the kids are walking around talking out loud, holding up their pictures. And once they find the person who has their match, they freeze and hold them up into the air. Once the classroom is silent, you know that you're ready to review what everyone has. So this is a day one really, well, probably not day one because they would need to kind of already know the vocabulary, but very early single word level activity. Um, Elementary students love it. I do do it very frequently as a warm up activity, even with my seventh graders. And when they do it, they've learned to, once they've found their match, they stand in a circle side by side with the person with their match. And then I have a teacher leader who goes around the room and has them call out their words as a, an accuracy, accuracy check. This is also nice because if a student doesn't know how to say their word. So if I have a penguin card and I don't know how to say it, I can still hold it up and I can listen to hear if someone's saying that word and that might hopefully spark me to remember, oh, it's pinguino, I know what it is now. Um, and these, making these cards is not a lost art because there's a multiple of other activities that you can do with them, like a memory matching game, do go fish games, so you can still do other things with them. Another favorite activity of my students that does not require a lot of language initially is Four Corners. 
So I prepared these signs using my bitmojis that say basically, I put them in the four corners of the room. I like, I love, I don't like, I hate. And this is a great day one activity because you can just review how to say each of those sentences, you know, those chunks of grammar, of language. I project a picture on the board. It might be, do you like pickles? And the students and all that stand up and walk to the appropriate corner. And initially, all they might say to their part peer, you know, the people in that group is no me gusta. They don't have to say anything more. But you can provide some nice scaffolding as you're working through content with this. You notice that I have some white space in the middle. And that's because as we progress with a certain theme or topic, I put extra language in there to help them talk about why they like or don't like something. So if we're talking about foods like pickles, I might have, you know, it's delicious, it's spicy, it's crunchy, it's a whole bunch of descriptive words. So when they go to their corner, they can say, me, I love it because it is sweet and spicy and delicious. And so that's a nice way to kind of layer on the scaffolding with the activity. It's great for getting students up and moving and talking to each other, but I run it fast, 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 because if you leave them too long in their corners talking, they're likely to get off task. Another activity that I love, I've heard um, is called, I call it quiz, quiz, trade, or pregunta, pregunta, cambio in Spanish. And um, this is an activity I've heard of multiple versions of. It's not mine, but I've heard of many people using a similar activity. So whatever our topic might be, I prepare question cards. So it might be, what do you like to do after school? Do you like to read books? Um, what do you do with your family? Do you like to play video games? Whatever the questions might be. Each student in the class gets one card and then they, and in fact, um, my students kind of laugh at me. I do this as a warm up activity, but I take them at the start of class and I'll tell them, you know, and actually I forgot to mention this. You notice that I have these images in the top corner of each of my slides. I'm just going to go back. You see, I have the four corners. I have the penguin sign. Um, these signs are what I project. And this is part of that scaffolding in the routine. If we're going to play quiz, quiz, trade, I project this image onto my smart board. And so the students instantly know what the activity is. I don't have to go through beyond the first couple weeks of school and remind them of the expectations of how to do this activity. They see it and they instantly know. So in my classroom, I project this sign that says pregunta, pregunta, cambio. I take my pile of question cards and I throw them up into the air and they go everywhere and the students all like to come over and pick one up. So students will each pick a random card up off the floor. Um, if I might then walk over to Michael and ask Michael my question, he answers it. He might answer it in a single word. He might answer it in a complete sentence or he might get pretty fancy because I heard Michael's proficiency level is pretty high and he might give a nice elaborate explanation of that word, of that question. It doesn't matter. Either is acceptable. Michael will then ask me his question and then we trade cards. I have seen some people do this activity where there's the question on the back side. The students are told how they're supposed to respond. So I might ask, hold up the card and say, Michael, do you like to play sports? And the backside will read, no, I don't like to play sports. I personally prefer to keep it open-ended because it encourages the students to talk about themselves. I think kids much prefer to talk about themselves, but um, it feels awkward to me to have to tell Michael whether or not he likes sports because I'm guessing he probably knows. Um, so students then trade the cards and then go on to talk to somebody else. And so they're getting lots of practice mixing up and answering these questions, hearing others and how they answer. So they're getting some modeling then from their peers. Another game that just very incidentally by casualty got the name Lobito is a typical kind of what might you might use as like a ball toss game. 
where you have a ball or some sort of object that you throw around the room and do questioning with students. I think this is great for the early levels. Um, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, lobito means the little wolf. You see I have this stuffed wolf over here on the right hand side. Um, basically what I do is I post a question on the smart board and I also post the sentence structures for how to respond. So I'll begin by tossing the talking piece to one student. I ask them the question, they respond, they then toss it to another person who responds and we'll move around the classroom in that way. I like this because typically the student who volunteers to be the first one to go is that student who's like, oh, 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 you know, the one who always knows the answer to every question. But it's great because they know the answer to the question. So I've modeled an answer. And now you have another student modeling the answer to the question. And then usually the second question, person to answer will be another one of those students. So by the time you work around the room, those more reluctant students have heard it modeled multiple times. And it's, I would say there's exceptions, but it's pretty common that eventually everybody will feel the confidence to be able to respond. Again, it doesn't need to be in a complete sentence. They just have to communicate on the question. And this ended up being called Lobito because I used to have a ball, it was an inflatable earth ball that I used. And the very first day I tried to use this in September with one of my classes, I couldn't find the ball, like on the spot picked up the stuffed animal and it became the Lobito game. My students loved it. Um, it's funny as I was preparing this presentation and thinking how many of these activities I'll have to modify or won't be able to use initially when we go back to school because I can't really see myself throwing a cloth, you know, furry covered wolf around the room and having everybody touching it or even the laminated quiz quiz trade cards. So, um, that did make me a little sad to think about. Another wonderful activity that I learned from Laura Terrell. She gave a keynote at Nectful a few years ago and she shared this activity. Um, teachers love to hear no prep required. This is a zero prep activity. It's also a great um, you know, the, the times when you finish everything you thought you were going to teach in, in half the time and you don't have anything planned for the rest of the class, or those, oh my gosh, those days where you just get the class going and there's a fire drill, and by the time you get back into the classroom, you only have five or ten minutes left. And so what do you do? I'm telling you, alternative bingo is going to be your new next best friend. So basically the way it works is whatever your target vocabulary is for uh, you know, the lesson or the content or any sort of review, you have the students just brainstorm out a list. And so if we were um, you know, talking about subjects at school, for example, I'd have the kids brainstorm out in the target language subjects at school. I write them all on the board until we get kind of a list going. And then you ask students to take a piece of paper and something to write with and just choose four of those words. So you might have a list of 10, they randomly choose four. They write those four down. And then I, as a teacher initially, this is a great student task once they learn how to play. Initially as a teacher, I would then circumlocute the, the terms. So I might say it's a class where you do a lot of multiplication, you do a lot of division, you do, you work a lot with numbers and pretty quickly someone's raising their hand and saying it's math. And you say yes, if they have that on their list, they can cross it off. And once students have crossed off everything on their list, they call out bingo and then they read the terms back to me. I love this because it teaches circumlocution. It, and I think it's something that we as the educator need to first model for them but it's such a great skill for them to be able to pick up. It's also neat because I never purposely teach my students, you know, at that level, words like multiplication and division, but they're hearing it in a very comprehensible way. And so they begin to absorb words that aren't necessarily part of our target vocabulary, but they're cognates and they're able to understand it. I also will say that I love to empower students to take on the role of doing that circumlocuting. 
and you would be amazed at how novice learners can do it. They, 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 with enough practice with this, they can do it. It's really remarkable. I can then also do this as a center activity. I'm a big fan of doing centers in my class, and it's a great student-led interactive center activity. And I have to tell you, one of my favorite jokes a student made of all time was last year we were talking about places that you might go visit in a foreign city and one of our target terms was an archaeological site we were doing um mexico Edgar. and i started to circumlocute and i said it's something that's very very old and one of the students raises his hand and says maestra meaning the teacher um so he made a joke in spanish which was really cool uh, so alternative bingo no prep kids love it it's a lot of fun builds great skills. Another great activity some of you may know of as headbands. We call it hot seat in my class. And part of the reason I called it hot seat was because I wanted to give a name to the game in the target language. So it's Silla Caliente. Um, but there were also terms that the students new, so they were able to kind of understand the implications of the game the first time I, I played it. And, and the first time we rolled it out, I was very dramatic about it. I like dramatically rolled a chair up to the front of the room. I turned it so that it would be facing the class and not the whiteboard. And I said, who is ready for the hot seat? And of course, the ooh, ooh, ooh kid raised their hand. Um, but what I did on the smart board was project an image of the target vocabulary and kids in the class then had to circumlocute the terms. So if we were talking about, you know, classes in school again, and I posted a picture, an image of math class, the students would say things like muchos numeros, a lot of numbers, and then immediately they would guess what it was. So the student sits with their back to the image, the class circumlocutes and the kid in the, the seat needs to try to guess what the term is. They also um, really like to play a variation where I divide the class in half and they work in teams. So stu two students sit with their back to the board and there's this competing chaos on both sides as they circumlocute and then we have to see who might say the word first. This can also be used as a center activity. So if you take those cards that you made for Pinguino earlier in the year, you can use this as a center activity. So one student will hold up a card that just has the image on it, and the other students in the center will circumlocute the term and the person holding it up to their head has to guess what it is. And again, often when I do it as a center activity, if they have four students, they like to turn it into a, a competition half and half. So these are very engaging games that can be played even at the novice level. It gets the kids talking. It gets them excited. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Comparisons. This is an activity that was inspired by the amazing Greg Duncan, who does the Connecticut Proficiency Institute for us each year. In fact, I think he's doing it in Connecticut beginning tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, so Greg Duncan shares a lot of great strategies for building proficiency. And one of the things he talks a lot about are info gap activities. And some of the first times I went to his presentations, I absolutely loved the ideas of what he was sharing. And one thing that he often shared um, in some presentations I've been to is, I don't know if you remember, like when you were a kid and you go to, or maybe if you have kids and you go to the restaurant and they give you the little kid menu and and there's like activities for the kids and there'll often be a part where there's two different drawings and you have to go through and you have to look at what's similar and what's different between the drawings. Like, oh, in this drawing, the kid has one shoe on and this drawing, the kid has two shoes on. Well, Greg Duncan has modeled an activity like that where you have images like that and you have two students sitting back to back and one student says, in the target language, in my picture, there's a woman. The other person might say, in my picture too, there's a woman. Um, he has some amazing images that he uses for that, but every time I've seen it, they look too complex for my novice learners. There's too many innuendos, too many subtleties that they just don't have the language for yet. So I did start to make some of my own, and this is an example of one that you see when we were learning um, school materials early in the year. I just created two different pieces of paper with clip art. 
So you have a backpack, they were learning how to talk about what they needed in their backpack. And you see both of them have a backpack. They both have pencils, but there's different numbers of pencils. This is all really simple vocabulary. And so what my students did was sit back to back with each other. And one student would start and say, in my backpack, I have a pencil sharpener. The other one would say, I don't. Then student B would say, in my backpack, I have an eraser. Student A would say, oh, me too. Um, and they just kind of went back and forth and um, questioned each other and shared what they had and didn't have, and then completed a Venn diagram to compare and contrast just with vocabulary, really simple language, what they had in their two backpacks. They really enjoyed this activity and kind of the reveal at the end to see how good of a job they had done in tracking all the similarities and differences. Another great activity that I um, heard about from Greg Duncan was a describing and drawing game. So you, he had some drawings. One student would have the drawing, the other student would have a blank piece of paper. Again, they sit back to back and one student describes and the other student draws. And this is something that you can certainly vary the level of enormously. The examples I've seen him use were often too complex for um, novice learners, but I loved the idea of it. And so I thought, how can I recreate this for my students? Um, so I've even done it um, with really simple things like plans for a house, where I just have squares that might have you know, bedrooms and uh, a bathroom and a kitchen. So one student has a drawing, describes, and it's just really simple language. There are three bedrooms. To below the bedroom, there's a bathroom. Um, just really, really simple language. And what we've also done it with describing classrooms. And again, I just created these images with clip art. We might have a classroom with five desks in it, um, a whiteboard, a certain number of chairs, a computer. And so one student describes and the other one has to draw. They then also love to do a gallery walk afterwards where I post in the classroom the original drawing and then all of the, um, the renditions below it. And they just kind of like to look at how the accuracy of the different groups. Um, and this is also an activity that you can differentiate pretty easily by varying the complexity of the drawings that you make. Um, so when we were doing it with classrooms, I had some really simple, easy classrooms and I had some tougher ones. And I just told the students to pick the drawing that they wanted to work with. And so it was nice to see them try something really easy and then try to level it up for themselves. So that's a fun one that the kids really like. This is an activity that I learned from Valerie Greer and Wendy Mercado. Um, they're both teachers in New York. This um, is a, a crossword puzzle activity. You know, I, I'll admit I do like to do crossword puzzles um, for basic simple stuff, but sometimes I feel a little bit guilty that they're um, busy work or something. And so I really wanted to try to, I love this idea that they had where you create a crossword puzzle that has a sort of information gap in it. So what you do is you create two crossword puzzles that might be on a similar topic and if let's say I'm playing with Dawn now, um, I have the answers to the questions on her crossword puzzle. So she has a list of questions that are her clues and I have the answers to them. I then have questions, clues that I need to fill out my crossword puzzle and she has the answers. And I will typically provide the answers in a table that has clip art in it. Uh, my students all share their bitmojis with me and I like to work their bitmojis into some of these activities. So for example, when we were talking about activities that kids like to do, I might have, you know, what Edgar likes to do, what his favorite activity is, what he likes to do with his family and what he likes to do with his friends and have several students represented. So then Dawn is gonna ask me, what does Edgar like to do with his family in the target language? And I have to refer to my chart, find Edgar's little bit moji, look under where it says family, and then see an image of that activity. I don't have the words there. I have an image of Edgar playing soccer or a soccer ball. 
And so I would say to Dawn, oh, he likes to play soccer. So that's Dawn's answer to the crossword puzzle. Um, so this is a great way to get them talking and it provides that kind of information gap for them to, um, they need each other and they need to talk to each other in the target language to complete the task. Let's see, how are we doing here? And I just noticed 244 people have taken time out of their summer to join us. That's amazing. All right, running dictation. I loved this activity. I also learned about this from Valerie Greer and Wendy Mercado, and I did put my own little twist on it. Um, it's great for getting kids up and running. It's great for, it doesn't require a lot of prep. And it's great for working on language chunks. Um, you need to do it with an activity, or at least this is the way I've done it. Maybe you have another idea and I wanna hear it. That requires sequencing. So um, if you think of routines in the day, which can be kind of boring and monotonous to teach, or class schedules also could be boring, monotonous to teach. Um, and you think of those language structures like on Monday, you know, at 10 o'clock. Those are kind of like these language chunks. It's a great way to practice it. So you take something that is in a sequence and you write large sentence strips. I cut them up and I go and I tape them out in the hallway. Kids are in groups. They have a piece of paper to be able to write these sentences down on. One student in the group runs out into the hallway memorizes the sentence and then comes and reports it back to the group who needs to write it down. Then another person goes out, they need to kind of remember what the first one was, memorize it, come back and report it to the group. So it gets fun as you um, move along because it's harder and harder to find a unique sentence, but they're getting so much practice with language chunks and they're motivated to, to do it. Now, there, there are some precautions. <laughs> they get very excited. So I find that I have to stand in the doorway and be like, be careful, be careful, be careful, because you have kids running in and out of the room. Um, I was so confident in my class that I actually left this as a sub plan when I was away at some conference last year. My students were amazing, but they got flagged on the security cameras because the security card kept seeing <laughs> kids running in and out of the room and they knew I wasn't there. And so they came up and like put the kibosh on the whole activity. But um, so take it from me, stand in the doorway and warn the security guards ahead of time. Um, but one of the ways that I kind of altered this is I used it for recipes. And so we were studying foods. I know Edgar likes to eat good foods. Edgar, we did it with a recipe for mole from Mexico. And so I took really simple sentence strips of the ingredients for mole, like chop onion, um, add water, whatever. And they were actually a little bit more complex than that because my students were ready for it. But put all those strips up. The students um, had to write them all down and then they had to figure out what were the appropriate steps to the recipe, how to put it into the appropriate order. So it requires some thinking on your part of the sentence you do. And then they watched a YouTube video of someone preparing mole to check to see if the work that they had done was accurate. So my students love this, it gets them up and running. Uh, guess who? I um, have always done a lot of interviewing activities. So you get students to interview each other and share information and then you introduce your friends. So I might introduce Mike, you know, learn all about him and then introduce him to the class. I always kind of felt like these needed something more. So we do this guess who game. Um, in Spanish we call it personas misteriosas. So I ask students to go out and interview. I might have a class of 24 students, but they have to, you know, I'll set a time. They're expected to interview at least five students. And they complete a chart with the information about all of those different students. And then when they're done, when time is up, I will read off the description. So I'll say, this person loves the color purple, loves monarch butterflies, loves to teach Spanish, but doesn't like pickles. And then they have to, based on their interviewing, they kind of look around the room and they think back to the interviews they did, because I have their papers now. They don't have their papers anymore. And they have to think back to who that was and they start guessing who it was. Um, so it's a nice way to kind of give a little more purpose to the, that interviewing activity that we might do. Whisper challenge. I think this might be my last one. I'm rounding up just in time, Dawn. Um, Whisper challenge was like the rage a few months ago all over social media and I thought I have to try this. Um, Meredith White, who I know is presenting or has presented with you, shared about it on Twitter and then she told me that it, it actually came from someone else. And I, I apologize 
if I'm not crediting the original source. But students have a list of questions of sentences. Um, they partner up. One student is going to listen to music kind of loudly, but not like eardrum damaging loudly. The other student reads the sentences, like whisper reads the sentences. So um, I'm sorry, the closed captioning might not pick this up, but I might say something like, mole has five onions in it. Sorry, that's too many onions. But I'm going to kind of like whisper read this to Edgar, but Edgar's like, you know, rocking out with his mana music over there or whatever. And so he's trying to lip read and think about the context of what I'm saying. And he then says back the sentence and it's hysterical because, you know, Edgar's going to come back with what? There's no toilet paper left in the bathroom. And I said, no, you know, um, and so the kids really have fun with this. I did want to give it a purpose. And so this is another use of that interviewing game. So one thing I did was had students interview one student. So let's say Dawn might go and interview Michael, but then she goes and does the whisper challenge with Edgar. So here we're getting the do you, like, because Dawn's asking him, Michael's saying back, I do whatever. And then Dawn has to go to say to Edgar, Michael does. So you're getting the first, second, and third person verb tenses in without really drilling on it. You're doing it in context. So Dawn's going to go and do the whisper challenge with Edgar and be like, Mike loves to play soccer with his family. And Edgar, of course, is going to be, you know, taking these wild and crazy guesses. Eventually, Edgar's going to write a bunch of sentences down, and then he's going to go check his accuracy with Michael. Is it true that you like to do whatever, whatever? Students loved this activity. Was that my last one? Yes, I did it. That was my last one. So back to you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Holy smokes, the chat has just blown up with so many ideas. Um, so many people have had so many wonderful ideas for ways to adapt a lot of these to a more remote environment. I think you'll enjoy even looking through the chat, Rebecca, for some of the ideas they came up with. Um, Edgar, would you and Michael like to report in a little bit about um, some of the things you're seeing on Twitter and in chat? Uh, certainly, Don. Rebecca, thank you so much for those great ideas. Everybody is loving them. Uh, they are saying that really uh, they love seeing the great ideas. It, in some ways, it's a reminder of some old ideas that they had and they have not used in a long time. And also the importance of having clear goals in order to target the right proficiency levels of students. So thank you so much for sharing these great ideas with us. Michael, what are you seeing on the chat room? Yes, that's been the same uh, general theme on the chat. Lots and lots of interest. They love the ideas and they love how they can be changed uh, to work on uh, remotely. Uh, one lady, Rachel, did have a question about the quiz quiz uh, trade. Uh, how doing that remotely, how would you do that on Zoom? So this is my whole dilemma. I told you that as I was, um, you know, developing this, I had told Edgar that I, I, I wanted to do a normal classroom presentation and share some of those activities, but it is hard for me to think that there are some of these that I, I, I don't know how I would do through Zoom, but it's a great question, a great challenge um, to think about. Um, so I would love to hear it if someone else has an idea. Yeah, I know some of the some of the teachers in the chat did share some ideas they had for adapting some of the things that you came up with in your presentation, Rebecca. Um, so you guys make sure that you go back through and look at the chat because I think they had ideas for ways to adapt things using Flipgrid, um, using Padlet. Um, what were some other things I saw here? Using Zoom, breakout rooms. Um, so it might not be exactly the same way, but it might still get at the same kind of skill practice. Um, go ahead, Michael, you had something else you were gonna say. Oh, well, there was just another question from Cheryl that she had asked several times about uh, in the activity when you were describing the Venn diagram, which, who actually wrote in the Venn diagram? Who, who, they, they both one, do, it's a, I mean, oh. I, I think it would depend on your students and, and your own philosophy, but they could, they could do 
they could each do their own. So, you know, it, it, I think it would depend on what your learning goals are. But if you wanted to kind of emphasize that I have, he or she has, we have, I might ask them to each do their own because it would be hard for them to do one Venn diagram that says that. If you were didn't care as much about those language structures and it was just more about them making comparisons, they probably could do one that's like, A has this, B has that, they both have this. Okay, thank you. Well, I, um, I want to make sure everyone knows that you are going to have access to the chat. I know there have been some questions in chat because so many good resources and ideas have been shared there. So you all are going to get access to the chat. When you leave the webinar today, you're also going to be given a link where you can click on the survey. Please help us by giving us some feedback on that survey. What did you find useful? What did you find helpful? What would you like to know more on? Um, it kind of helps us as we plan with our partners, like um, with Edgar, what kinds of things our, our participants are wanting to, to see and do more of. Um, also wanna let you know that you can follow the Twitter feed. I know there was a question in chat about Twitter. If you go to hashtag empowering with languages, you'll be able to follow the, the Twitter feed from webinar one all the way in the beginning, all the way until the end next Monday. Um, so don't forget, we do have another webinar, same time, same place tomorrow, if you're watching all of them with us. Um, tomorrow we will have Meredith White with us and she's gonna be talking about um, engagement and participation. I have a feeling that just like Rebecca, she's gonna have a treasure chest of ideas to share with you guys. Um, I did put a link in the chat for you all, if you wanna go ahead and, and start clicking on that survey before we leave. Um, I do also just want to extend my sincere thanks and gratitude to Rebecca again for, for joining us today and for putting together such a powerhouse presentation. Everyone wants the slide deck with all the ideas. <laughs> We're super excited about getting access to that. Um, but I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I know you have so many things on your plate. You guys just have no idea how many hats that Rebecca wears and she does everything with such grace. And so thank you for joining us, Rebecca. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. This is a pleasure. So you guys can follow MFLA and Avant More Learning on social media. Um, and if you follow the hashtag in Twitter, you're going to find all of this there. You'll be able to access it all there. Um, and you'll also be able to find it through the, the email. You guys will get an email 24 hours after today. Tomorrow you'll get an email and it will have a link to you for you to the folder where you'll have the slide deck, you'll have the chat, and you'll have your certificate. Okay, so look for that. It, you may want to check your spam folder. If it doesn't show up within about 24 hours, check your spam folder just to be sure. So you guys, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you, Edgar and Michael for, for partnering with us to be able to do this and for managing the chat and the Twitter and just participating with us and for inviting Rebecca to join us. We're so glad that you guys are part of this with us.